Okay, to start with, I have been getting many requests about the solutions of the homeworks. <coughs> well, I'm against distributing solutions to the homework. If you want solved examples, there are hundreds of solved examples already on the web, and in your, in your book also, you can find many questions with solutions. Now, one purpose of the homework, at least some of the questions in the homeworks, will be so that you will not be sure on your own whether you have, done the, you have the correct answer or not. So you should start looking at answers. And you should ask your friends, you should search the internet, and believe me, if you do search the internet or ask your friends, look at the books, you will learn much more than what I am teaching in this class. But if you know that I will be eventually distributing the solutions, you will not do that. You will just wait for the solutions, look at the solutions, memorize the solution, and that would be it. So I'm against the distributing solutions. You will have recitation hours, and we will arrange for it, where they, you can discuss the homework questions with the assistants, but well, with the assistants, at least, uh, there is no guarantee that they will know the right, right answer. But there is no such guarantee even when I answer one of your questions, I might be mistaken. But you, you usually ignore the, that fact. You just think that, you, okay, the professor knows everything, so he has the right answer. So if he says so, that's correct. You don't do that for the assistants. You, so you can discuss the homework questions with the assistants. I will not solve them. But of course, I will, if you insist, I might solve one question one question that is especially complicated or hard for you, but since I will be solving one question now, if you have the homework, you should hand it now. I will not accept any more homeworks handed uh, later in the class. I will solve this, uh, the question, this one. So we have a plus Q here, plus Q here, minus 2Q somewhere over there. So what is the potential at this point? Now I will solve this question now. In the break, when you go to the break, you can also pick up your first quiz. Okay, so let's come back to this question. We can just choose some coordinate axis. Let's say this is x, this is, oh, this is x. This is y and this is z. Well, in the, in the question, the coordinate axis might be different, but the critical thing is we have two identical charge, charges separated by some distance, and in the middle, we have another point charge which is uh, so that the net charge is zero. Okay, some of you went to the internet and looked, found all these legendary polynomials, multiple expansions. Well, those are things that I will not talk in this class, but at least now you know them. You have an idea that there are such things. And that's because I'm not giving you the answers. So, we look at this point. Let's say this is the, the position of that point. Let's, let's just denote it by R. Then we have this distance, which is R1. And this distance, let's just call it R2. And 
there we have this vector, uh, which is a z hat, and also this vector, which is minus a z hat. <coughs> so let's start with R1. What is R1 in terms of these parameters? Well, you can use the cosine theorem or vector calculus, whichever one you like. This is nothing but the square root of R minus a z hat squared. And hence, this is equal to square root of r squared minus 2 a r cosine theta plus a squared. This is r1. Now, r2 is similar. It is the square root of r minus minus a z hat squared. And this is equal to square root of r squared plus a squared minus 2 a r cosine theta. No, this is plus. <coughs> That's the main distance. One is minus, the other one is plus. Now let's look at our potential. Now we want to write the potential at the point r. This is, okay, q over, no, 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. This is the same for uh, all the particles. This is the same constant. So it's Q over R1. This is the potential created by this charge. Be this is at a distance R1 from my point. Plus Q over R2. This is for this charge over here. This is plus Q at a distance R2. And then I have this minus Q charge at a distance R. minus 2q divided by r. Now, I have to calculate. Well, q is also common. I just can't take it out. I need to find some approximation of 1 over r1 and 1 over r2. Now, let's look at 1 over r1. This is well, the inverse of r1. This is equal to r squared plus a squared minus 2ar cosine theta to the minus one half power. It's just this expression over here. R1 is the square root of this expression. We have one over R1, so it is the minus one half power. This is equal to R squared to the minus one half, one plus A squared over R squared minus two A over R cosine theta to the power minus one half. Or let's write one over R one. This is equal to one over R one plus A squared over R squared minus two A over R cosine theta to the minus one half. Now we are also we need to calculate the potential at a distance R much, much larger than A. So a squared over r squared is very small. a over r is very small. So this number over here is much, much less than 1. Well, even here, this term is much smaller than this one. So at, at the first approximation, you can even ignore this term. Now, in this calculation, I will ignore ignore anything smaller than a squared over r squared. a squared over r squared terms I will keep, but a cubed over r cubed terms I will just ignore, or anything smaller, because a over r itself is very, very small. It's of the order of 10 to the power minus 5, let's say. Its square is 10 to the power minus 10. It's cubed 10 to the power minus 15. It's negligible numerically. So 1 over r1 will be 1 over r. So let me just copy this.
Okay, this is my expansion. So this is approximately equal to one over r, <coughs> one plus minus one half a squared over r squared minus two a over r cosine theta plus minus one half minus one half minus one times a squared over r squared minus two a over r cosine theta, everything squared plus higher order corrections. <coughs> now those corrections will be very small. They will be much, much smaller than a squared over, they will be smaller than a squared over r squared. They, uh, there I have terms like a cubed over r cubed, a to the four over r to the four. They are very small. I'm just throwing them away. Now in the dipole calculation, what we had actually done is we throw away this a squared over r squared terms. And if you had done that in trying to solve the homework, you had seen that you got zero. So that is why I'm, I mean, when you throw away this a squared over r squared terms, we will get zero. And that is why I still, no, I, that's why I still keep this a squared over r squared term. It will give me the non-zero contribution, the first non-zero correction. And this will be equal to one over r, one, plus a over r cosine theta. Now the a over r term, I have just a single one from this one. Here I start with a squared over r squared. Now here I have an a squared over r squared term. Let me also write a squared over r squared term. From here I have minus one half. Well from here this is one minus one half minus three half. It gives me minus three four plus three four, three fourth. Then I have the square of this term. Well, the square of that term gives me a squared over r squared and four cosine squared theta. Plus terms of the order of a cubed over r cubed. Now this sign means there I have terms that are proportional to a cubed over r cubed or they are even smaller. I'm not writing them, I will just throw them away. So what we have is one over r1, one over r1, this is equal to one over r times one plus a over r cosine theta And then minus one, now let's say a squared over four r squared, or let's even cancel these fours, a squared over r squared times minus one half plus cosine squared theta, plus three cosine squared theta. So this is an approximate value of one over R1 at the point that I'm looking at trying to calculate my potential. Now I, I need to do the same thing for one over R2, for R2, but if you compare the expressions for R1 and R2, the only difference is that A is replaced by minus A. So I don't have to go over all this calculation. I already have my results for R1 one over r2 is equal to one over r1 minus a over r cosine theta plus a squared over r squared minus one over four plus three cosine squared theta. I just changed a to minus a. This term changed sign and uh, the a squared is replaced by minus a squared but it is also the same. So let's go back. Now we have an approximate expression for one over r1, one over r2. What I need to calculate is this one, this expression over here. So v of r was q over four pi epsilon zero, one over r1 plus one over r2 minus two over r. This is equal to now let's look at the first term. 
I have from 1 over R1, I get 1 over R. From 1 over R2, I get 1 over R. That makes 2 over R, but then I'm subtracting 2 over R. So that is 0. I don't get any contribution from these first terms. Let's look at the second terms. I have minus A over R plus A over R squared from 1 over R1, minus A over R squared from 1 over R2, and well, this is just the 1 over R term. It's not proportional to 1 over R squared. So these terms also cancel. The only contribute, the non-zero contribution comes from these terms. I get the same contribution from 1 over R1, the same contribution from 1 over R2, and that's what's left. This is Q over 4 pi epsilon 0. Now Q A squared over 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. 1 over r cubed minus 1 over 4 plus 3 cosine squared theta. And this is the approximate value of the potential at the point r. Now, of course, I have other corrections to this. All these terms that I have neglected, like a, a in this expansion, like the a cubed over r cubed term. But as I said, in a practical situation when you will be using these expressions, the, uh, if you just imagine you are measuring, let's say, the uh, potential created by an atom, let's say like the carbon dioxide. <coughs> now, this, this is a simple model of carbon dioxide. You have this carbon dioxide where you have the carbon atom in, in the middle. You have oxygens on the side. Oxygen should be slightly positive, the carbon should be slightly po uh, oxygen should be negative, the carbon should be positive, or the other way around. But basically, it's this system. You have two charges, you have a linear charge distribution, two identical charges on two ends, the opposite charge in the middle, the whole system is, uh, uh, is neutral. And when you measure the carbon dioxide, the potential created by a carbon dioxide, you don't really go to very close distances to the carbon dioxide. You are at a very far away distance. Let's say uh, the size of the atom is of the order of 10 to the power. What's the size of an atom, typically? Hmm? No. Around 10 to the power minus 10 meters, typically, the size of an atom. Now, let's say you are making a measurement at the well, 10 to the power minus 5 meters, a micrometer. It is even larger than 10 to the power minus 5 meters. Well, your distance from the uh, atom itself is 10 to the power 5 times the separation of the charges in the atom. So this A over R is of the order of 10 to the power minus 5 in a realistic case. So the, the next term, if you can measure your potential, the correction to this potential will just be in the next fifth digit after the comma. So it's, it's just negligible. You can just keep this one. And here you will see another coefficient, this QA squared. Whatever property you calculate for the system, the first correction will be always proportional to QA squared. Like in the case of the dipole, the properties of the dipole always turned out to be proportional to Q times the separation of the dipole. Now here it always turns out to be proportional to QA squared, which is given some other name. But we will not be going into that detail. You will do that in your third year. Okay, any questions about the homework? Okay, this one. Taylor expansion. You should have already seen it, right? Did you see Taylor expansion in calculus? Not yet. Anyway. Well, th this is the hint that you were given. This is, I mean, well, let's do a bit of Taylor expansion that I have already mentioned you. Let's just assume we have some function. We might not know the exact form, but it has such a shape. 
And let's say that we are looking at it at some, looking at its values at a point close to x0. And we know its value at x0. And let us say that you are interested in its value. This is your f of x as a function of x. What is f of x1? x1 is somewhere over there. So what is your first guess? You know f of x0. What is f of x1? I want its value. I don't want to know its relation with x0 or f of x0. What is the value of f of x1? A first approximation. Hmm? I mean, even on non, non, I mean, we don't even need to go that much. f of x1, its value is close to f of x0 if x0 and x1, they are close to each other. That this is just the first approximation. Let's say that this is not enough for you. I mean, you want to be more precise. So what you do, you can just assume that, okay, in this region, I mean, your curve just looks like a line, a straight line. So you can just approximate the curve by this line. That is tangent to your function at the point x0. So you see that it is not x0, but it slightly is different from x0 by this much. And that difference is nothing but <coughs> plus f prime of I at x0 times x1 minus x0. This is the first correction. You just make a linear approximation. The line passes through your point at x0, f of x0, and it is tangent to it. Well, let's say this will give you some a better approximation than the first one. But let's say you want a more precise fit. If you want a more precise fit to the exact value, and assuming that you know all the derivatives at the point x0, what you do is you can just Rather than a linear approximation, you can make a quadratic approximation. That is, you, just, you can draw a parabola that is tangent to your curve at that point. So uh, let's just draw a parabola tangent to my curve right at that point. And of course, if I want my parabola to approximate my curve, very close to this point, I want the parabola and my point to have the same value at that point, same derivative at that point, same second derivative at that point. And in that case, your function just becomes plus 1 over 2 f double prime at the point x0 times x1 minus x0 squared. Now, this function, which is a parabola, has the same value as f at the point x0. It has the same derivative. It has the sec same second derivative. So they, are, they, they look quite similar. And uh, the value is actually much more similar. And of course, you can go and plot higher order terms here. Like you can add the cube term, the fourth power, the fifth power. And the general expression is that f of, let's say, x1, this is equal to f of x0 plus the derivative of f at the point x0, x1 minus x0, plus the second derivative at the point x0 times x1 minus x0 squared divided by 2 factorial. So do you know the factorial? Okay. Plus, of course, you add all the terms, plus f, the nth derivative, x1 minus x0 to the power n divided by n factorial plus etc. Now, this is f n x0. The notation, this is nothing but the nth derivative 
evaluate that x is equal to x0. This is what we call the Taylor expansion. Now the question is how, how accurate a value do you want? I mean, in most of the cases you don't really know the exact value of a function, but you can calculate each one of these terms. Well, in physics that is basically what your life is ab about. You just calculate as close, to, you try to calculate as close to as possible what such functions are. Like what is the charge distribution of a given system? We don't know. We cannot even measure the charge distribution directly. We mainly measure the electric field and the potential that that charge distribution creates at a distance. Like when you are measuring the atom, how can you measure the atom at the point? You just look at its effects, like the electric field and the potential it creates. And basically, the, the question is, how, first question is, how precise is your measurement? They say if your measurement is, uh, can give you, uh, is precise up to, let's say, 1%, and if this term, the contribution of this second term is 0.001%, then you have no idea what this term is. This term is smaller than your error, so you are not actually determine, determining this error in the, in the measurement. You are determining only these two terms, like the charge of the system and the dipole moment of the system. If your uh, measurement is not precise enough, those are the only, th I mean, if they are not precise enough, you will only measure the charge. If they are more precise, then you will be able to determine the dipole moment. If, if when the technology develops and you can make more precise measurements, then you can determine the quadrupole moment. And, well, you will never be able to determine all of it. So that's why, in fact, we are studying this dipole moment and quadrupole moments, because those are the things that you are actually measuring. I mean, in, in these courses, we always start with a given charge distribution, and you are required to calculate the potential or the electric field. But in real life, that's not usually how things work. You measure the potential and the electric field and try to determine the... And you measure the potential and the electric field with an error bar. And from those information, you are trying to determine the charge distribution. No. It has nothing to do with Taylor expansion. I mean, you have, uh, most of you have uh, made the question as complicated as I could, I mean, more complicated than I could have imagined. No, I mean, I, there I should have a factor of two, right? Yes, this two. This two I had forgotten. Thank you. Here there is this correction too. Well, you measure the potential or the electric field. Well, they are the same thing mainly. And once you determine the potential, you see what we have done until now. The potential of any given charge distribution. This will be 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. I'm, I'm assuming that there's some charge distribution over there and you are measuring the potential over here at a distance or the electric field. It will be Q over R plus 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. P dot R over R squared plus 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. let's say, something over R cubed. Something over R cubed times minus 1 over 4 plus 3 cosine squared theta. Plus, etc. 
this is the potential of an arbitrary charge distribution. And, and as, you, as, you, as you see, each term contains one higher power of 1 over r. Considering you are looking at from a far away distance, each successive term will be much smaller than the previous term. So is your measurement precise enough to determine these? Other questions? Which the uh, that's the unit vector, you're right. Well, she lost a lot of time trying to figure out whether that was a unit vector or not. In the homework. Hmm. Okay, any other questions? One question, you had one chance, and you used it for the second question. <laughs> okay, in the next homeworks, let's, let's make a deal. If you agree on one question, I will solve it. One. Okay, let's do an example. We will have other questions that we like we did on Tuesday, but we will do it in the next hour. Now let's suppose we have, I mean, up to now we have been dealing with single charge distributions, point charges. Let's just assume a continuous charge distribution. What is your favorite sh symmetric shape? Somebody? Sphere. A ring. Cube. Well, mm -hmm. cylinder. Okay, sphere is kind of nicer, but it's the it's too easy. Let's let's do a disk. Let's start with a ring. What is the potential created by a ring? Not an, at an arbitrary point, at some point somewhere over here along this line. It has a radius r, we are at a distance d from the center of the ring. <coughs> now we already calculated the electric field to calculate the potential. It's more or less the same thing. So our formula, our expression for the potential This is valid only and only for point charges, and this r is the distance of your point charge from your observation point, the point at which you are measuring the potential. This is not a point charge. But, I mean, we can always divide it because we know that the potential is additive. The potential created by uh, charge distribution is nothing but the potential the sum of the potentials created by parts of this charge distribution. So I just divide my system into very small parts. Okay, one question in the pre-reports was that why do we divide the charges but not the distances, for, let's say? I'm not dividing the charge. So I'm not dividing the distances. I'm dividing my system all the time. I'm always dividing my system into very small parts, the properties of which I know. Now, in this case, I know the properties. I mean, that's the potential created by a point charge. So I'm dividing my system into points. My system is now a collection of points. And it just turns out that each of these points have a, have a part of the total charge. And I can calculate the total charge of each one of these points. Let's say if I take this part, which has a length, let's say, dl, if my total ring has a uniform charge q, 
then the charge of this part will be nothing but q over 2 pi r. This is the charge per unit length. Well, I don't have unit length. I have a length dl times dl. This is the <coughs> contribution to the potential at this point of this charge. No, th this is the charge of this charge. And uh, now I can write the contribution of this charge to the potential at this point. Let's just say dv. OK, this is again potential. It's not the volume. dv will be equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. The charge, which is q over 2 pi r, times dl. This is my charge. And then I need to calculate the distance of my charge from this point. Well, the distance is it's just d squared plus r squared square root. This is the contribution of the total potential at this point of this very small segment. Now what is left, I need to sum all these contributions all these very small contributions. Now, if you look at this expression, for each one of these segments, 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 is a constant. Q over 2 pi r is a constant. 1 over d squared plus r squared is a constant. It doesn't change as I go from one segment to the other segment. So this is nothing but 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, Q over 2 pi r times 1 over d squared plus r squared sum over dl. Now here, what I call dl is the length of this segment. It's not the dl vector. It doesn't have any direction. It's just the length of this segment. Well, the sum over all these length of these segments gives me the circumference of my ring. But the circumference of my ring is nothing but 2 pi r. So they just cancel. And the potential is nothing but 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 q over square root of d squared plus r squared. And I'm done. No. It, I mean, if it was just like if the charge was at the center, I would only get Q over D. But I don't get Q over D. Of course, if I am at a very, very far away distance from the charge, that is when D is much, much larger than R, I know that this is uh, uh, R I can just neglect, then I just end up having Q over D. Now let's do one more thing. Let's just play with this expression a bit. This is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 Q over D times D uh, 1 plus R squared over D squared raised to the power minus 1 half. I just took one factor of d out of the square root, and this is what remains. Now I can just use the expansion that I already know to expand this factor. This is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, q over d, 1, minus 1 over 2, r squared over d squared, plus higher order terms. Yeah, I just use the same Taylor, exp Taylor expansion. If when d is much, much larger than r, I just keep the first few terms. If I'm at a very, very far away, then it, the ring just looks like a point. Now, from close up, it's, it's a ring. It's not a point. So this is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, q over d, minus 1 over 8 pi epsilon 0 q r squared over 
d cubed plus higher order terms. So we already have this exp expansion. So this, this first term tells me that, OK, the system has a total charge Q. I don't have a 1 over d squared term, which basically tells me that it doesn't have any dipole moment. The dipole moment is 0. Then I have this uh, 1 over d cubed, 1 over the distance cubed term, which tells me that this, is, this ring has a quadrupole, a non-zero quadrupole moment. Then, of course, we have the other terms. But we have infinitely many of them. The first few has their names. The first, like, eight, one, it has their names. Now, when you do a measurement, <coughs> now, if you measure that, okay, something has a total charge, but it doesn't look like it has a dipole moment, but it still has some quadrupole moment, you can claim that it looks like a ring the charge distribution. We are trying to extract information from how the charge is, I mean, we just, we measure these terms and from what we measure we try to extract what we, uh, what we can about the charge distribution. Now let's go to the disk. Again, this is my disk. Radius R, total charge Q. And again, I'm looking at a point somewhere over here at a distance T. This is filled. Again, this is not a point charge. So I cannot use this expression. It is neither a ring. So I cannot use this expression. But nevertheless, I can divide it into, uh, let's say, this time rings, because I already have calculated the potential created by the rings. I can assume that. Okay, let's see, this is my disk. I can, this is the center of the disk. I can divide it into rings, etc. Each, an arbitrary one of the rings will have a radius r. It will have a thickness, let's say, dr. The area of that ring will be the area. As 2 pi r times dr. I mean, if you just cut the ring and open it up, it will just look like a long rectangle. So the charge of that single ring will be q over pi r squared times dA of a single ring. So the potential that a single ring creates will be 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. Now, we, can, we should use this expression, 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. Charge of the ring, well, in this case, the charge of the ring is q over pi r squared times 2 pi small r dr. This is the charge of my small ring. And then divided by the distance of the, my observation point from, the, from my ring, from any point on my ring which is nothing but 1 over square root of d squared plus r squared. Now the final answer, well, I have to sum all of these. Well, this time, depending on which ring I am con considering, the factors over here are changing. So I have to write it as an integral. This will be 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 q over pi r squared times 2 pi integral or sum r dr divided by square root of d squared plus r squared. Okay, so what are the limits? What is the 
where did I start from the, the smallest value of r? <coughs> Zero. Largest value of r? Hmm? Capital R. This is my potential. Yes. Mm -hmm. As you wish. And this is your answer. I mean, here we are just directly calculating the potential rather than the electric field. But as your friend has suggested, you can also calculate the electric field and once you know the electric field, you can calculate the potential. But the problem is that if when you want to calculate the electric field, most of the time, you have to pay attention to the directions of the electric fields. So you have to sum the contribution of each part of my system vectorially. In calculating the scalar potential, you don't have to worry about the direction. That is kind of a simplification of the potential. But if you prefer, you can, of course, calculate, first obtain the electric field, and from the electric field, you can obtain the potential. Other questions? No. Just use this fact. Other questions? Okay, see you after the break. You can pick up your quizzes.